Hi, I'm Jared Casper. I'm a senior research scientist at NVIDIA working at the Applied Deep Learning Research Group here to talk to you about uh, scaling up training of natural language models on GPU clusters. Uh, so a little bit about me before we get started. My primary focus is on this very topic on scaling up machine learning models and training them on large clusters and all the systems issues that, that arise when we try and do that. My background is more in computer architecture and programming languages, system design, lower level stuff like that. But I transitioned to AI about seven years ago when I joined Baidu, and then I joined NVIDIA about five years ago. And I've been working on systems for AI and NVIDIA uh, all this time We're at the Applied Deep Learning Research Group. A little bit about that group. Uh, we work on a lot of different AI problems that are in important to NVIDIA and that NVIDIA cares about. One of the, the more uh, prominent things we've, we've done that you may have heard of is DLSS. Uh, that's one of the, the technologies that we developed and put into a, a product. Uh, we also work on things like VLSI, on different vision tasks, and uh, the group that I'm in, uh, natural language processing. And I've, I've touched on a lot of these different things on, during my time at NVIDIA, but right now we'll focus on natural language processing. So today I'm going to be talking about the history of language models. These are machine learning models that try to understand human language, mostly uh, text, and try to understand what they mean and, and also generate text and produce natural text. That sounds good to us. And so there's a long history of trying to do this, as you see along the bottom there. But as part of the deep learning revolution, this area, like all others, has really exploded. And in the past few years, there's these models called transformers that really do well in understanding human language and text. However, they have a lot of parameters. And so if we, if we look at the, the number of parameters in these models over the past several years, we can see that they are growing exponentially. So this y-axis you can see is logarithmic. So this is an exponential growth in the number of parameters in these language models. Uh, you know, way back in 2018, we started at about the same size as, as you know, state-of-the-art vision models, but we've grown exponentially since then. And then we just recently uh, combined NVIDIA and Microsoft we trained a 530 billion parameter model. So these models are, have a lot of different parameters, as well as if you look at the complexity. Right? So the, on the left is the number of parameters, on the right is the complexity. You see both are, are exponentially growing. So this is the, the kind of number of operations that are needed to, to train the model it grows pretty closely with the number of parameters in the model. And so we have these language models that are getting very, very large. And so let's look at that 530 billion parameter model that, that we most recently trained. Uh, you can see some of the parameters there if you're interested, but kind of the, the key points here is, is look at how much memory this takes on the, on the device. So we're looking at 8.4 terabytes just to hold the state that is needed to train this model. And this is all on device memory. So these take up a lot of memory as well as the number of operations that are needed to perform, right? So we're doing 16.9 exaflops per iteration. So just to do a single iteration through the model, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what that means later. That takes 16.9 exaflops. So to fully train this model, we're looking at 1.6 yada flops. So I put a little table there because we don't use yada very often. I think we're running out of prefixes. That's kind of the scale that we're, we're going to when we're training these very large language models. So looking at the computer that we've been using to train this thing, it's a fun toy to play with. It's the, now the sixth largest, just got down from the fifth to the sixth largest on the top 500 list. Each node in this cluster has eight A100 80 gigabyte GPUs. Uh, we have you know, several thousand of them, and they're all connected with a, a very high performance InfiniBand interconnect. It's a really high performance uh, HPC cluster that we're able to, to train these models on and, and use them effectively. So looking at how many GPUs we have to use to train these models. So as you can see, as, as GPUs grows, this is how well we scale the teraflops per GPU. We're able to scale fairly linearly with the number of GPUs. So as we add GPUs, the achieved teraflops per second over the cluster goes down. We're able to scale all the way up to a trillion parameters. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we can achieve this kind of linear scaling and maintain efficiency of the GPUs. You know, looking at the estimated runtime for like a one trillion parameter model would be about two months, right? So this is kind of a huge investment and we really, you know, any small uh, gains in efficiency will yield large results in the end runtime because these, these models train for a long time. You know, and, and looking forward, right? So these models are very expensive to train. 
uh, you know, GPT-3, which is an, another big model, costs about $12 million to train. But their value is really good, right? They are worth the time and the effort put into training these models because they really do a great job of understanding text and being able to generate text. So this is an example where this model was just trained on text from the internet. But as we give it a few examples of an English to Spanish translation, we can see that after just seeing a couple of examples, it knows we want it to translate from English to Spanish. The green is what we've given it. And then you can see that the black text is what it outputs. It's able to understand what it is we want and, and do the translation. So th these models are really good. Text is, is a very generic medium that describes basically all of human activity. So if we can get really good language models, we can really spread this out into a lot of different uses, a lot of different domains. So a little bit of background on just machine learning and, and how to train these models in general, if you're not familiar with the process. What, it, what a model is, is it's, it's several layers of linear algebra operations, a lot of matrix multiplies and, and nonlinear functions built on top of one another, so several layers of these. And we just put some data in on the input. In this case, it's a picture of a tiger. And we put it through all these operations, and output is a prediction. In this case, it said, ah, I think that's a lion. And we say, oh, that's not quite right. Actually, it was a tiger. And from the difference between what it predicted and what we wanted it to predict, it can create gradients or cha slight changes to all of the weights in each layer of the model, update those weights to better predict what we wanted it to predict. And then we do that again and again. You know, just look at you know, thousands and thousands of examples of data. And over time, the weights are able to, to modify until they're able to output correct predictions. So that's kind of how we how we train these models. And an iteration is when we when we look at several points of data and get gradients for all of those different points, and then we update the weights. So that's uh, one iteration of a model is, is one update of the weights of, of the model. And so, you know, when we, we want to do this, we want to use several devices or lots of GPUs to, to be able to train this model. So different ways that we do this, that we parallelize it, is one is data level parallelism. So this is when we take the model and we put one instance of the model on each of the different devices, and then we show each of those instances different data. Right? So we take that kind of group of data, what we call a batch, that we wanted to show it during this iteration. We split it up into smaller chunks, and we give each device, each model, a different chunk of that data. They figure out their weight updates. We do an all reduce, so we combine all those weight updates, and then we do an iteration. So that's data level parallelism. Another thing that we can do is we can do model level parallelism, where we take the actual model and instead of replicating across different devices, we split the model up onto several different devices. One way we can do this is tensor level parallelism. So as we take one of those layers, one of those matrices or tensors, and we split the tensor up into onto different devices. Right, so each layer is split up. That's called tensor level pose because we're splitting up the tensor. And then also we can take each layer and put a layer on uh, or one or more layers across different devices. We call that pipeline level parallelism, it's similar to, to pipelining a computer processor. So we're going to look at each of these different types of parallelism in more detail right now. So data level parallelism, again, is we're putting each instance of the model on different devices. They all look at different amounts of data, and then we do an all reduce at the end to gather the data. This is what was traditionally used to parallelize models for, you know, ever since uh, deep learning uh, kind of took off, you know, a decade or so ago. Uh, and this worked for, for a long time, right? So uh, one of the issues is, is that it's, it's constrained and that uh, a model is only on a single device. And so we can only train models that are small enough to fit on a single device. But as you know, the last few years have gone to these larger and larger language models, the models got too large to fit on a single device. And so we, we weren't able to, to kind of expand to use more and more GPUs to train these using data level parallelism because a single model didn't fit on the device. As well as uh, if we want to limit the batch size, so the batch size is right, again, how many, how many uh, pieces of data it looks at for a given iteration. If we want to, you know, if we wanted to use data level parallelism across 3,000 devices, then at a minimum, we'd have to look at 3,000 different uh, pieces of data. And if we might not want that large of a batch size, because as we look at more data, it becomes less efficient. We've gotten as much information as we need, and adding more data doesn't help for this iteration. And so data level problem is, is uh, kind of makes it so that we have to use a big batch size if we want to um, use a lot of different devices. So that's another limitation that we ran into for data level parallelism. So we want to look at model level parallelism now. 
So as I said, one of those is the tensor level parallelism. So this is when we take an individual layer, an individual tensor, and split it up across multiple devices. So the way that we're going to do this is uh, we're going to take our input here is X and F as a replication. So we're going to replicate the input across all the different devices. And then we have the weights of the layer is in A. And we're going to split those weights up column wise. And then when we do the multiplication for that layer, we're taking the full input that's given duplicated it. And we only multiply it by a portion of the weights for that layer. And so that kind of splits up this individual layer. And as we go through GLU as, as a non-linearity and we get the outputs of this particular part of the layer, we can continue on and further matrices we have to split by rows, right? So B here is another matrix in this model. We split it up by rows. And since the way the math works out, we're able to just continue to kind of do this math separated out across all the different devices. But then when we get to the end where we need to pull all the different parts of this layer back together, then we do an all reduce of all the outputs of that layer. Uh, this is G is a, an all reduce. And then we can do things like dropout, which is a, another uh, layer that we make use of. And then we have a single output in Y. So this is how we kind of split up a particular layer or a tensor across different devices. So this, so again, looking at the different ways we can do model level parallelism. So that's tensor level parallelism. Again, in this case, each device has is working on every layer, just part of every layer. Another way we can do this is pipeline parallelism is when we kind of split it up the other way so that device zero might be working on layer zero, one, two, and then device, the next device is working on layers three, four, and five. So we're splitting up the layers across multiple devices. Now, so this is just a, a different form of parallelism. So looking at how we would do pipeline parallelism, if we do it naively, where we just kind of send the, the input through all the, the devices pipelining, we can see that we don't, we're not making very efficient use of all our, our GPUs, right? We have a lot of dark gray here, which is when the devices are sitting idle. And uh, we actually don't see any uh, parallelism if we do this naively. So what we need to do is we need to take that batch, take that uh, chunk of data that we're looking at for this iteration and split it up into smaller groups what we call micro batch sizes or micro batches. Then as we go through a micro batch, since this is all part of a single iteration, we can do them, them back to back. So this is going through one micro batch, we do the forward and backward, but we can immediately start on the second micro batch as soon as the first one is going through. So as you can see, as we, as we go the forward and backward passes of the, all these different micro batches, we're able to fill in all these dark gray spaces, and make more efficient usage of our GPU. And then once we're done with that batch, we kind of flush the pipeline and we, we start with the next batch. We can see that our pipeline bubble, this section of dark gray, is, is a lot less. We're making much more efficient usage of our GPU as we add more micro batches as we split a batch up into smaller chunks. So we can actually create an analytical model to see how this uh, pipeline bubble changes and you know, figure out how we can reduce the pipeline bubble. So it's, as you can see, it's based on the number of pipeline stages, so the number of devices that we've split our pipeline across and the number of micro batches, right? So if we, if we increase the, the number of pipeline stages, that makes the pipeline, the, the pipeline bubble bigger but if we increase the number of micro batches, that decreases the pipeline bubble. So we want to kind of trade off between our pipeline parallel size and the number of micro batches that we see in a batch. Looking at kind of the trade off between data level parallelism and pipeline level parallelism, in this case, you know, say we have 64 GPUs. How do we decide how much tensor level parallelism and how much pipeline level parallelism that, that we can? It turns out because tensor level parallelism is much more communication intensive, right? Because we're doing those all reduces to kind of gather back into a single tensor. It's much more communication intensive. So we don't want the tensor level parallelism to go across different nodes. So if we look on the far left of this graph, we have a high degree of tensor level parallelism and we're doing those all reduces across nodes. So it's less efficient. But as we decrease the tensor level parallelism size and increase the pipeline level parallel, then that communication decreases till we get to the point of 8.8, which is where the tensor level parallelism completely fits within a node. And so we're able to make more efficient communication within the node. And that's uh, where we achieve the highest utilization of our GPUs. Now, if we continue to decrease the tensor level parallel size and increase the pipeline level parallel size going further to the right, then we can see that we're we're making less efficient use of our pipeline because we have too many pipeline stages, that pipeline bubble goes too high and we start to, to trail off our, in our efficiency. 
And so we, we really hit that sweet spot where we've maximized the tensor level parallelism within the node and then use the rest of the GPUs for pipeline level parallelism. So another thing that, that we can play with to kind of decrease the pipeline bubble of when we're doing pipeline is we can change the schedule of when we do the forward and backward passes. In particular, if we take the layers of our model and we put fewer of them in each device, and then we go through the devices several times, what we call an interleave schedule, then we're able to decrease the, the pipeline bubble because each pipeline state has fewer layers in it. But what that looks like is a really complicated figure. You don't really need to fully understand uh, what's going on here. But basically, we're going through the, the devices several times in our pipeline, and that can decrease the pipeline bubble size and make much more efficient usage of our GPUs. Really, you know, the key takeaway is we can, we can play with the schedule of when we're doing all the different layers in our pipeline to reduce, reduce the pipeline bubble. And, you know, there's an experiment again where, you know, we're looking at the, the uh, efficiency or the, the achieved uh, flops of each GPU. And when we have a small batch size, right? So when we don't have a lot of micro batches to kind of fill in that pipeline bubble, changing up the schedule, doing this interleave schedule can really help out quite a bit. Whereas when we have a lot of micro batches, when we're able to use micro batches to fill in the pipeline bubble, it does help, but, but not as much. Um, so, you know, kind of looking at all these different things that we, we've talked about to, to, uh, to paralyze uh, training of the model, um, you know, how do, we, how do we explore this configuration space? So, you know, some of the knobs that we have, we have the, the data, tensor, and pipeline level, uh, level parallelism. How much of the GPUs are we allowing to each of these different uh, ways of parallelizing the model? We also have the pipelining schedule, right? Do we do a, a simple schedule like we first started out with, or do we do an interleave schedule? Or there's, there's even, you know, more complicated ways that we can schedule the forward and backward passes to, to eliminate that, that pipeline bubble. As well as we have the batch size. What is our global batch size? How much per how many how much data are we looking at per iteration? And then the micro batch size. How many how small of chunks are we splitting that global batch size up into? So these are all the different knobs that we can play with. And so then the name of the game is how do we efficiently uh, make make the most efficient use of our GPUs by by turning all these knobs and playing with all these things. You know, because all of these things have uh, kind of interacting influences in how the GPUs are used. Uh, I don't have time to go into a lot of details and, and you know, more details in how that all works, but we have a recent paper in a supercomputing conference that has a lot more details about how we can turn these knobs and, and, uh, and play with this to, to make efficient usage of our GPUs given the model that we're trying to train. So a little bit about the implementation that we did. I uh, just wanted to let you know that this is all open source. So we have a, a library called uh, Megatron that uses its built-in PyTorch and supports you know, all of the stuff that I've talked about here, all of the pipeline level parallelism, the interleaved uh, schedule as well, you know, so we can scale up to train you know, trillion parameter language models, as well as uh, you know, it's also efficient in training all the, the smaller models. And so you know, feel free to go check that out and play around with it. All of the stuff that we've talked about is, is in there. And so as I uh, mentioned briefly, we used this and we actually uh, used uh, DeepSpeed from Microsoft to combine the, the, two, um, the two code bases to train a 530 billion parameter model. Uh, recently, we call it Megatron Turing NLG. I just want to quickly you know, put that out there that we, we trained that and it actually does really well. I won't go into a lot of the, the details of all, you know, all the, the numbers on the slide, but it did well across the board. The different ways that we evaluate this is there's uh, zero shot learning, one shot, and few shot. So zero shot is when we don't give it any examples of what we want it to do. We just say, you know, here's you know English, and then we say Spanish, and we hope that it figures out that we want to translate. Whereas up to you know a few shot is this example that we showed before, where we give it a couple of examples of what we want it to do. Right? Here's the English. Here's the Spanish. Here's the English. Here's the Spanish. And we give it the English, and then we expect it to to see that what we want is the Spanish. So that's called few shot learning. And so we can, we can see that this 530 billion parameter language model outperforms you know, other models in all these different tasks in both zero shot and few shot learning. So it really, you know, as we added to the parameters, it really does, does get better. And we put a lot, uh, some information about that. I also wanted to mention that now what we're now doing with this 530 billion parameter model is looking at how we can use the prompts that we give the model to better control the output. Right, so looking at things like toxicity and bias. So the, the input data, as it's reading all of the data off the internet, is going to be a lot of toxic language. 
there's going to be a, a lot of um, bias in, in that data. And, but we don't want that to leak out into the output. And so what we do is we can play with the, the way that we prompt the model and the, the examples that we give it to try and better control the output. It's one of the, the pieces of ongoing work that, that we're working on right now. Finally, I just want to conclude with a, a few lessons that we learned as we were training this 530 billion parameter language model. It took us several months and you know we, we hit a lot of road bumps on the way and we, so we learned a lot. One of the things that we learned is that checkpointing really matters, right? So we did this on a shared cluster. There's other users of this cluster that, that want to use it. And so what we really want is we want to have uh, small, shorter jobs to make just, you know, so just do a few iterations per job. But if we spend a lot of time both reading and then saving the, the checkpoints so that we can restart later, then we end up using a lot of our job allotment on just uh, you know, loading and then saving the model. And so it really, we had to really optimize the, the checkpoint of this. Uh, so, you know, if, if you remember, we had, you know, several terabytes. I think one, one model took up 8.4 terabytes of data. So there's a lot of data that we need to write out and save again. So we really had to, to look at the optimization of that so that we could, you know, both load and save at the end and still have short jobs that, that made a lot of progress. That was one really important thing. The other is looking at the, the batch size and the tensor level parallelism size and the pipeline parallelism size. These all affect the number of GPUs that you're able to, to run the model on. And when using a shared cluster, we want to be able to, to, to dy dynamically change the, the, uh, the size or the number of GPUs that we're using to train, right? For a, a given week, we might have the cluster to ourselves and we can, you, we can use the entire cluster. But you know, another week, another group might have a deadline, so we only want to use a quarter of the cluster. So we want to be able to to change the number of GPUs we're using, and so we want to we had to choose our our batch size and our model parallel sizes correctly, so that we had a lot of choices in the number of GPUs that we can use. So we want to use kind of highly composite numbers, and so that as we as we combine all these things together, we have a lot of choices in the number of GPUs that we use. You know, as I mentioned, you know, on a shared cluster, we want to be able to change the number of nodes, uh, and that was that was really important. And you know, even being able to change them dynamically from from uh, during the run, right? So if uh, if we're using all the GPUs, and then somebody comes in with a high priority high priority job, we want to be able to to cut back on the number of GPUs and let that high priority job go, but we don't want to completely cancel out our training. So we want to be able to cut down the number of GPUs that we're using. That was that was really important to be able to to uh, make efficient use of the cluster as a whole and really get this this training through in as little time as possible. Um, the other thing that, that we found is that validating ideas is really cheap, um, right? So as I mentioned, these things cost several million dollars to train and they take months and months to train. So if you can spend a, a week or, you know, s some small amount of time that may seem like hard to validate an idea, it's really important to make sure that, that that's validated beforehand. It's worth it to, to save all the, the hassle of trying to, to debug in the middle of a run. Because once you once you start this thing, uh, it's very hard to to change, and uh, we it, all the ideas need to be validated beforehand. Because if you know you see something during like a ten billion parameter run, for example, that that doesn't look quite right, that's uh, that has a little bit of instability. That's just going to be worse and worse when you get up to five hundred you know five hundred trillion parameter models. And so you want your smaller models to train very solidly very efficiently and you know you want to make sure all the kinks are out before you you, you know, run a, a large model. That was a, another thing that, that we found. So there's just some of the, the lessons that we learned that, that uh, came up as we were training this this large language model. Uh, but that concludes my talk. I appreciate your time and attention and have a good day.